Great, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Mickey May, I'm the founder of Friends Indeed Gallery. We're based in San Francisco. Um, we're an absurdly small vitrine gallery um, and we host exhibitions and also talks and programs as well. Um, today's talk is between Miriam Katziff, who's the deputy director at Artist Space, and Lauren Quinn, who has a show up at our gallery now. It's her first solo exhibition here in San Francisco. Um, so just to give you a brief introduction, Lauren, who's born in 1992, um, lives and works in Los Angeles. She earned her BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, attended Swahegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and received her MFA from Yale School of Art last year in 2019. Uh, Miriam Katziff is a deputy director of Artist Space. Uh, Katziff was the director and co-founder with artist James Hoff of Primary Information, a nonprofit publisher of artist books and other media. From 2005 to 2014, she worked as a director at Team Gallery in Lower Manhattan. Uh, some of you know her from there. And uh, she's also carried exhibitions and programs at Swiss Institute, MoMA PS1, White Columns, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. Um, so for this talk, uh, Miriam and Lauren will be in conversation for about half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, if there's any questions that come up during the talk, uh, feel free to type it in the message box and we'll get to them towards the end. Uh, we ask that you um, please mute your, um, your screens so um, you have a chance for Miriam and Lauren to, to, to talk. Um, so thanks again for everybody uh, for being here today and I'll kind of pass it off to Miriam now. Thank you, Mickey, for this opportunity and thank you, Lauren, for being so generous with your time. Um, how about we start out, Lauren, um, with an overview of how you make your paintings? Um, yeah, so basically the way that I start a painting is um, I just start with color and then I'll put down a, a collection of drawings or one large drawing, sometimes a shape, and then from there I look at several paintings together and I sort of um, lay down these thicker tubes, which is kind of um, two paint colors that are kind of blended together and it becomes this thicker mark. And then from there, I um, draw back into the wet paint or I scratch out the paint. And then sometimes um, I start building with a more transparent layer and it sort of becomes this process that has a lot of um, details on top of each other. And that's sort of the, the start to finish of layers. Um, yeah, so that's normally how I do it. But the, but the, it always changes depending on the paint. Sometimes, um, like this painting that I think has got the screen shared, um, there was a painting underneath, and then I, then I used the thicker tube to kind of make a pattern. And that pattern kind of became the last mark. And then when it was dried, I took a knife and I carved in smaller drawing into the surface. Um, in addition, at the end when it was dry, I printed a so ink, kind of a contact print. And um, so behind it, there was, there's drawings on the back of the painting. And then the imprint of those drawings is this red ink. And um, sort of in, in between when it's almost dry is when I do a lot of pulling through and drawing again and sort of kind of teasing the paint, um, the wet paint into different places. So um, I think the image is shared here. Basically the white mark is um, the raw gesso, which has been carved out and the red mark is printed. Um, so I think the way that you use drawing really kind of pulls the viewer's eye through the painting. And you mentioned that um, you start out by drawing on the backs of your paintings. Do you um, 
how do those factor into the painting that we see? Like, what, what's the relationship, basically, to the drawing on the back of the painting and the resulting painting? So, some, I mean, I work on several paintings at once, and sometimes the, the result of drawing on the back of the painting is that there's a contact print on the other side, like a monoprint technique. Um, and that is the impression of the drawing, sort of the mirrored of that drawing on the other side. But then other times um, I'll draw on the back as a way of, or even on the painting surface as a way to plan for a painting next to it or a future painting or um, sort of parse out a previous painting. So I feel like they start to really collect from each other. Um, yeah. As you're working on all these paintings side by side in your studio, you don't, these paintings for you, they're not a series, even when they're simultaneous and kind of responding to each other. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, I work on maybe like five to six paintings at once. Um, and I really kind of carry over from one painting to the next doing like one will be a very busy painting and then I'll try and sort of make its counter or like its opposite or something to respond to it. So there's sort of, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't come about as one body of work. It sort of keeps overlapping and moving and marching on. Yeah, uh, yeah that's how I do them. Has um, the past several months and the kind of like <laughs> isolation um, of COVID, has that affected the way that you paint at all or what you're painting? Well, I mean, I think that travel has been really helpful to kind of like gather a lot of different um, sources. And um, during the shutdown, it sort of became this place to kind of recenter and make work that was um, like I, just like the options were limited. Um, so I started looking back on older paintings a lot and um, kind of mining from those as much as possible. I, um, I also think that there's just so much you can find every day, like in your archives of, of drawings and whatnot. Um, so that has been really useful, but yeah, there was a time when um, the shutdown happened that I kind of made a makeshift view in my garage thinking that um, that we weren't going to be able to leave our block like in Italy and um, even changing locations kind of refreshed the way that I was working and um, helped me keep going. I mean, this is working is kind of the one consistency that I have right now. Um, so yeah, it's been good and bad. Oh. <laughs> so this is, this is, Something is shared here on the screen, but this is um, this is a picture of the back of gross smoke and it has a lot of drawings and um, those drawings are printed on the other side and then worked into and that's me installing. <laughs> and when were the when were the works in this show made? I see summer from 2019, summer from 2020. How recent are the most recent paintings? Right. So gross smoke was made in 2019. Um, and it was sort of, I mean, not a breakthrough, but like, it was a new way of using the mark that I thought was, um, I've just been using it since. And then like, for example, leaks is sort of another take on this technique, um, this sort of pattern. So um, leaks and uh, moving target are both quarantine, post quarantine paintings, post COVID paintings. Um, moving target is just a word that I kept hearing over and over again and everything is still a moving target and um, you know there's there's sort of this like swallowing space um, this sort of like radiating target that was that was sort of my starting shape for that painting and um, I very much was letting the what I was hearing on the news and um, you know what I was reading just like soaking it in and trying to trying to make something through that place so there's there's moving target yeah and is that pretty typical of how you title your works like do you 
you have an idea based on a word or a phrase and then you explore it in painting or sometimes do the titles come afterwards? The titles definitely come afterwards. I don't really think that, you know, I mean, I, I think that even with the title like Leif and Barrow, um, they're sort of like poetic arrows in that direction, but I don't really think, I think that I want, I want the titles to be a nudge, but not, um, they're not a firm location. I want it, I want the painting to be like taken as it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not, not linguistic in that way. Um, so those ti- I mean, moving target was something that was swimming around for so long. And I, and I honestly think of it as, um, it's a flighty title in itself, but, um, you know, for, for something like gross smoke, I was definitely combining, um, two words to sort of make this like very open place, um, to see the painting, um, like same with Leif and Marrow, sort of like a really open, um, like association between the two words, um, to try and find that meaning inside of it. Um, in going back to grow smoke and leaks, what you mentioned um, with this kind of like breakthrough, um, it seems like the patterns that you create in these paintings are used to disrupt the viewer's perspective. Um, but those patterns also make me think of the pattern and decoration artists. Um, and how they would kind of like fracture uh, the canvas with the breaks um, in their forms. And I was thinking of artists like Joyce Kozloff or Miriam Shapiro, but is that something that inspires you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's something about pattern which um, to a certain effect, it can be kind of sublime. And so that's been really appealing to me because it, it like offers such a width to it. Um, I also think that I've been using a certain type of mark for maybe two years now and um, pattern was sort of the uh, kind of next transformation of this mark to, to have this mark repeating itself so many times that sort of um, becomes like a whole shape such as in the blue shape in the center of gross smoke is sort of like it's coming back together um so yeah pattern can be sort of a cloud but then it can also kind of be this dense thing um and i i think that to negotiate between a pattern and the drawings on the surface makes like a really um like generative kind of reading space um and that's something playing with but also like repetition is such a tool in abstraction in that it um you know, to repeat something is to also like imply that it is meant to be that way. And so it's just like a perfect tool for what I'm doing at the moment. Um, Yeah. Sometimes when I look at your paintings, I begin to conjure kind of like almost collage elements of other artists and movements. Can you talk a little bit about which artists inspire you? I mean, well, so fundamentally, I think that I'm just in love with Charlene von Heil and Albert Olin. Um, but there's, but there's just like such a width of what I look at and grab from every day. Um, I've been thinking about this one, um, Georgia O'Keeffe painting of a tree trunk, and just the, the it's like very. Um, psychological image and I think that um you know the way that yeah the way that Georgia O'Keeffe sort of like grabs from her from her immediate surroundings was um like really useful to me but who else do I also look at I've been looking at a lot of Anna Zamankova's drawings they like very organic um very not repetitive but like kind of decorative um yeah, I mean, another side of this is I, I think I kind of developed the shape of the tube from looking at a Leger painting. Um, specifically, I was looking at his books, but the way that he sort of organizes light um, 
just really like was really effective and did something to me. And it was something that I started right at the end of my time at Yale and um, really opened up this whole language of trying this one mark out. And um, sometimes it can be like the thickest line and it can be in the forefront of the painting and it can be really sharp. Um, but other times, like even using this type of mark, this sort of tube that I borrowed from Leger, I, um, you know, I've, I've found that there's a lot of color opportunities in kind of isolating the colors to two colors um, and then using that as a kind of fragment in the painting. Yeah. You mentioned um, in an earlier conversation that that was like the softest possible gradation and that like gradients were like really only ever thought of in like graphic design in recent. Yeah, the well, gradient is a graphic design world, but word, but I was also thinking about um, as far as softness, I went to the Prado as kind of like this very generous gift to myself after I graduated from school last year, I went to the Prado and um, sort of had this pilgrimage trip. And when I was there, I saw this one painting that um, really spoke to me because of this certain like softness problem. It was this painting and um, in the center of the paintings, like very wide painting. And in the center and the crux of the painting was like, this toss off between of an egg between two hands and it was a brown egg. It was a very deep open space behind it. And it was, um, I mean, I, I use the word psychological to talk about Georgia O'Keeffe's painting, but for me, it was like this really quick recognition about like um, what your mind does to complete an image. So it became this softness problem, the softness of a brown egg and the hand and it's a light question too but it's like fundamental in painting that carries over through time like if i take this painting that i saw at the prado and i sort of divorce it from its historical context and use it just as like this is the painting i'm looking at and this is why it's effective um you know this this kind of shape of an egg um became like something i used over and over again and have re been repeating for the past year and um that's another, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that picking from different paintings like that, I definitely, um, I sort of, in the painting, when I return back to making the painting, I kind of, on the surface, I sort of parse out all the different things I'm thinking about, and I, I start to repeat that and track how they connect. So, for example, in um, Moving Target, I have this kind of deep tunnel space, but I've been thinking about the difference between like a tunnel and an egg and that they're almost exactly alike on a flat painting surface, but it's all about what you bring to it to change that um, experience and that reading. So, yeah. You mentioned at one point, like having a kind of like a romance with paint. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it's funny to do a show right now um, when so much of the work that I make, I mean, there's, there's like a far away view of them, but then there's also like a very close up relationship to it, like literally carving this close to my face kind of relationship to it. Um, so yeah, I do feel really romantic about it. I feel like it's a very touchy feely, um, feeling towards paint. <laughs> And a very physical relationship with yeah, that. absolutely. <laughs> um, so, in your own evolution as a painter, you got your BFA, but then recently graduated from Yale. How did your time at Yale affect your work? And is there any crossover between like that and some of the earlier works that are in your show? Yeah. Well. I mean, it's so funny, but um, when I was, for my thesis, which I, which I, you know, I kind of, I feel like I wanted to sew in my thesis, very, very painterly of me, or very like grad school of me to be like, I don't like my thesis anymore. But um, I do, it's been incredibly useful. But for my thesis, I was sort of painting floaters in my vision. I was like staring really close at the painting and then trying to paint at the white wall and then trying to paint floaters. Um, and so this sort of like up close looking is something that has sort of remained a line through my work. 
but being at Yale, I definitely have since been focused on sort of distilling and, um, you know, making as much clarity and space for clarity in the painting um, so that everything can come across because I think I pack a lot into them and I want, I want them to be read. Even if you sort of read different things at different times, I still want them to be read. So that's something that has definitely been useful from grad school. <laughs> yeah, it feels really unfortunate that we're having this conversation about your work remotely when there is so much going on in the surface of your paintings. Um, so who are five artists whose work you would want to live with? Okay, um, well, I, well, I've been thinking about this one. I, um, I saw an amazing painting yesterday. I've just started to go and see shows and I saw just an absolutely gorgeous painting at Parker Gallery of Maya Peoples Bright that I've kind of been thinking about over and over again. Um, I also would, well, Lee Lozano's drawings that we mentioned, I would love one of hers. There's, there's a drawing of like an oil can of Lee Lozano's that I've been um, sort of repeating. Sometimes I make, like I, it's like I love it so much I wanna make one of my own, so I'll put it in the painting. Um, there's also an Oscar Schlemmer painting that I saw at the Ludwig Museum in Cologne, maybe two years ago. And um, it was just so gorgeous in the way that there was this sort of like gray cast behind the, these like um, very kind of modernist figures. And um, the way, the effect that it had in person kind of looked like a patina, like it's like changing of light and I've never seen anything like it since. Um, so I would want that one. Um, there's an art sculpture, sculpture that I saw at um, SAIC when I was, when I was in undergrad. And um, I passed it like almost every day. And it's, I'd like to have that and being really stingy. Um, what else? Maybe a Lenora Carrington or something like that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I feel bad. It seems like traveling to see artwork seems like really critical for you. And now it's going to be very hyper local looking at artwork. Well, I mean, even yesterday I saw something. I mean, I think that there's so much to find online. It is like, it's, it is a new problem for me to try and confront. I mean, we were just talking about how like we, we don't have an end date for this. Um, but it, like having a screen space and that is like a new kind of new thing to deal with in the paintings. But um, yeah, I don't think that will change how I make them, how I, how I carve into them. Sometimes it's, it's also like um, something embedded in it that is only for me and for the few that find it. Yeah. It seems like looking at your work um, evolve that the paintings kind of get more and more expansive and for me they seem to want to grow in scale is that is scale currently restrictive for you um no I mean I think that I've definitely been sticking with like a specific type of range in scale mostly like six feet I think that there is um, you know, there's, there's a difference between the smallest mark to the largest mark, which is um, kind of relative to each other that this, that like a certain scale allows, but I've definitely, you know, once I sort of finish it, I, I want to keep pushing it outwards. I want to keep like attending to the corners of it. Um, so I feel like there are times when I could even push it wider and that's what I've been doing is sort of like as my, my future kind of goals for the paintings is to keep like if this one certain painting is a world to just like keep pushing it out like widening those corners um but with that like the etchings the um you know the like the pulled lines they all kind of their their access with scale it completely changes so it's going to be a really useful problem as i keep um 
growing, growing these canvases, making them bigger, um, that that is going to be like something that I'm going to be playing with a lot. I'm uh, really attracted to the parts of your painting that like seem to employ printmaking techniques like monoprints. And when um, you were just talking right now, I wondered like, are there any other kinds of techniques that you're looking to bring in? Um, because the, the carving into the painting that you're doing, uh, it is reminiscent of etching, but it isn't quite that. And maybe same with the monoprints, but do your future plans for works also involve future techniques? Yeah, I mean, I think like I've, I've always sort of stayed in a certain depth of paint, having the paint be like um, not, nothing that's very thick. Um, but recently what I've been doing is I've sort of been um, making very thick tube marks, almost like columns, like turning these tubes into columns and having the paint be very thick and then sort of carving into wet paint with that. So there's sort of a relief that's happening. I think that that's gonna be another tool. Um, but I mean, to, to expand on the, the, the mono printing, like it's something that has a, a history that I like picked up from Miro. He did these like exact same kind of prints and it's a very sensitive line, like to, to, to make an impression, it's kind of a fuzzy line with, with your pressure, you get like a thicker fuzz to it. Um, so there's something like very sensuous about it. I think um, to, it'll stay like in the touch sense is maybe what I'm saying. Yeah. It seems like there's like a um, working under these kinds of time constraints or like having a small margin for error with um, some of these techniques. But you also mentioned um, in an earlier conversation, like not really giving up on a painting, um, which I found kind of inspiring, like being able to return to it over time and rehabilitate it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, like, I don't, I don't, I think, like, because I don't start with a plan, necessarily, I don't start with, like, a vision of how I want this painting to look, um, this painting, or whatever I'm working on, um, there is this sort of, like, there, I have an openness of what it could be, and I really don't give up on paintings very often, I think that, like, when I do, I might turn it around and let the like failed painting be like the energy behind it to maybe push it forward and in a more romantic way. Um, but also like you were talking about like the working time and I'd like to be clear, I mean, like using wet paint, um, you know, pulling along the value of wet paint in to make it like a sharper drawing, what it does, it, there's only like an, a, like maybe eight hour window of when paint is like workable to do that. So, um, there's sometimes there's an imperative of like, got to do it now. I've got to take everything you've got right now and give it to the painting. But also um, afterwards, like there's such an openness of when I can um, pick something back up that I keep kind of moving them around and work on six at a time to kind of keep that flow. Um. Should we maybe open this up for questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Someone had written in a question about when you feel like the painting is finished and how you determine that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, there's several ways that, um, I mean, like intuitively you always know, um, but also like in the, the kind of criteria that it needs to meet for me, um, when I really know something is finished, I've learned from it. Um, but also, you know, I like there to be several areas to look through. I like there to be things that you can find inside of it. I like it to have, um, you know, kind of, the integrity of like a, an image from far away, like the integrity of the painting being whole at, at a farther glance, but then also to have things that reveal itself to you 
um, when you approach it, when you look closer. So those are a few things that I use. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I say it's intuitive because I always want to leave room for the discovery. Uh, so Jeffrey has a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask it to the chat room? Um, can I ask out loud? Absolutely. <laughs> so, hi, Lauren. It's nice to meet you. Hi. Um, I'm reading a book now called uh, Boom, which is all about art dealers of the second half of the 20th century. And there was a comment made in it that said, of the 500, yeah, of the 500 greatest artists since 1950, 10% came from Yale. Hmm. So that's a pretty nice compliment of your school. My question is, since you've graduated, has your attitude towards your art changed? Are you more liberated, less disciplined? Are you pretty much the same as you were as a student? What's the change like? Well, I mean, I moved across the country. So there was a shift in like the resources of the people that were around me. And I really had to work a lot harder to rebuild that kind of community. Um, and what by community, I mean like community of people I can approach that will give me like honest, critical feedback of the paintings um, and are willing to do that. But, you know, I think that something that's been helpful through Yale and through grad school, especially, I mean, there's only a few grad schools, um, but is the work the workflow, the pace of working um, in school, I sort of found a rhythm and I've definitely kept that discipline of like working time, um, you know, as something that kind of offers freedom to have, if you have that block of time, <laughs> freedom to do it, what you want with it. <clears throat> Any other questions? I got a question about that, like, uh, so there's a, can you elaborate on this kind of wet stage? It's like you've painted some of it and then there's this period of time that you need to take advantage of. I mean, what, this is like pregnant moment. Is it three hours? Is it a day? Like what kind of, what, what kind of time are you working with in this wet stage? Right. So <clears throat> one of the ways that I'm drawing in the painting when I talk about drawing in the painting, is I'll put, I'll um, paint down one of those tube marks, like a thicker, wider mark, and it'll have two colors, which is something that I've kind of adopted from Leger, and it'll still be wet. And what I do from there um, is I take like a very thin brush and I will draw in by dragging the wet paint, I'll draw in something. And um, I mean, I think you could see it look kind of at the center of um, moving target, for example, there's one very specific swirl. There's also like a leaf in there. Um, there is a spider web. There are like certain kind of vortex eluding shapes. And what I'm doing is I'm, you know, I'm pulling the wet paint, I'm pulling wet oil paint in and working through it like that. And so, um, yeah, there's only a certain amount of time that oil paint has that kind of give, and that comes from really working up close with it. Um, but that is the eight hour pregnant window that I'm referring to. And then afterwards, like um, once it's dry, I'll do, I'll carve into it with maybe a blade. Um, or when it gets dry, like I will also print on top of it with like an oil based ink and then uh, I can even do the same kind of pulling around with wet paint of the ink. Um, yeah. I just had sort of uh, more of a comment when it comes to, I mean, the paintings are so stunning in person. And, and like you say, there's so much layer and surface and the sort of kind of really delicate if it looks sometimes like filigree or something like that on the surface and, um, and certain movements that you make just really kind of like make the painting and get and give it so much depth like um 
when talking about moving target, there's some recognition of some figurative moments like a web or, um, you know, and you and I, we've been, when we were looking at some of the paintings and we, we looked at it, you know, you showed me some in process works and then you're like, actually like here it is when it's mm -hmm. finished. And it's just like, totally, um, it's, it's transformative, like any kind of move that you make. Um, but I think what really makes moving target for me is like that really kind of gestural moment of um, like, it feels like a rose or something like that in the middle of the painting. And then this kind of, these kind of movements around it that really draw your, your eye close to it. But um, anyway, that's more of a comment. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, great. Um, is, if anybody has any other, oh, we have a few message down here. Uh, Daniel Schwartz has a question. Do you want to um, go ahead and ask in the chat room or do you want to type it? Oh, if you can hear me, I'll go ahead and. Absolutely, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, Hi, thanks for doing this today. I, I just had a question. Um, you, you've talked a lot about the work in what sounds like a, it's like a tactile way to me, talking about touch, but I'm sitting on a computer pretty far away and I'm interested in this idea. Um, can you talk about that a little bit more? How are you achieving this? Is it brush stroke? Is it mixing materials? I'm just interested to hear more. It's really simple. Like it is, um, it's brush strokes and um, the way like this, I've been talking about this sort of tube, the sort of like thicker mark and what it is, is um, a modeled, a modeled mark. So it's sort of like blended in certain areas to like alluding to shadow or alluding to light behind it. And um, it's, I was kind of joking with Miriam, like there's no tricks involved. There are no, um, there's no extra tools. It's literally all hands. And that's why I sort of like want to elaborate on the touch aspect because I think that seeing it through a screen, it has this sort of like softening effect of that touch, of like the tactile nature of it. And, um, you know, like that is something that I always bring is more of like a, a physical <laughs> touch. It's a little bit grimier, it's a little bit more like felt. Um, how do I how do I make the tool soft brushes? It's um, oil paint with a little bit of extra medium, and it's like a very soft, um, you know, sort of sanded uh, surface that allows for, for a lot of workability. And um, from there, there are some you know, sometimes there's some working in with wet paint, there's some moving wet paint around, and then sometimes at the end when it's dry, I will carve into it. And those are very fine sort of scraffito lines. Thank you. Right, okay, well, speaking of pregnant moments, I should go tend to my own. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for joining us today for this talk. Um, we will, it's recorded and we'll be sharing it privately if anybody wants to um, share it with their friends and um, have a great rest of your day and hope we see you back here soon. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.